Yo, yo, yo. All right, so it's pumpkin season. So my last video about how not to get lost while backpacking inspired this because it got me thinking about my least enjoyable moments that I've had on the trail. I've been backpacking for many years now, so I've had a lot of moments out there that were just really shitty. And we're gonna talk about those today. So it's gonna be a little bit of story time, the worst I've ever felt on trail. I don't know about the Sam Adams, Jacko. It's definitely not my favorite pumpkin beer. All right, I got a list here. So I'm gonna title them as how I wrote them in my notes. So number one, Timberline Water. So this goes back to 2019. I actually went across the country by myself, my first major solo trip ever to Oregon. I did the Three Sisters Loop, it was a 60 mile uh, whatever, and then I went up to Mount Hood and did the 40 mile Timberline Trail. Starting this trail, I was confident, but I was also like really beat up. I was dealing with some pretty bad blisters because I just got out of the Sisters Wilderness. So I actually started this trail limping. And let me tell you what, when you're on mile one of a 40 mile loop of a rugged wilderness that you have never been to before, it's a little daunting. So night one, hiking two miles, camp, beautiful campsite, get up the next morning, the most beautiful sunrise I've ever seen in my life. Just loving it despite only clocking like 10 miles on the second day because I was limping. But I, I also remember just taking it all in and having one of my favorite backpacking days ever. Now day three, that's when things got interesting. So it rained all night. When I wake up, it's still kind of raining. And here's the thing about the Timberline Trail. There's a lot of creeks, I don't know what you call them, maybe glacier runoff that comes from the top of the mountain because you're circumnavigating Mount Hood. So you're going all around up and down these uh, ridges and stuff. What you want to do when you're out there is you want to make sure you cross all the water crossings early in the morning because the later on in the day the sun gets hotter it starts melting that glacier and the creek crossings just get well pretty f sketchy to be honest the day when i was on the northern section of the trail when i had five of these water crossings to go through it was raining and this was not fun. So tangent here, I wore this shirt in a couple videos ago and somebody asked like where, where they could get it at and you're in luck. So this is made by a brand called Into The AM and they are the proud sponsors of today's video. They're huge supporters of this channel and I cannot thank them enough for sponsoring videos, but they have just sweet products. That's why I rep these. I wouldn't talk about them if, if I was lying about this. So the material is actually good, the fit's good and the designs are awesome. Like look at this one, you got unsuspecting Bryce down here in his tent getting abducted by UFOs. Like this is just sweet. <laughs> one of my favorite shirts right now. So Into the AM still has awesome bundle deals. You can get three of the basic plain t-shirts, three for 50 bucks, and you can get three of the graphic tees like the one I'm wearing, three for 60. That's a great deal and you can actually use code Bryce 10 to get 10% off of your entire order. Now, if you're one of those viewers that's gonna say, paid promotion, automatic thumbs down, then go ahead and leave that comment now. I thought we were I thought we were friends, you know? You don't want me to succeed. Like, I love this. I love backpacking, I love making videos. You guys don't want me to make money doing this? Like, for real? You know, when I tell my friends I make a little bit of cash on the side from this, they're happy for me. Why can't you be happy for me? And I'm just, I'm just going to assume that you're not gonna be collecting a paycheck on Friday, you better not be making money off your hard work. <laughs> I remember getting into that first water crossing and thinking, we're not in Ohio anymore. Very sketchy water crossings. It, it would take me maybe like 10 minutes to figure out a perfect spot to cross because uh, I was kind of jumping from rock to rock. Now I'm pretty agile, I know my footing. When I'm making a jump, I'm very selective about it. I know how I'm going to land. I don't advise people do that, I'm a professional. <laughs> But there was a few times when I kind of stepped in the water, but I really did not want to cross in the water of a lot of these crossings. But this first crossing looked like a raging, like white water, like class five rapid. Now I know from experience that if you're gonna do a water crossing and it looks like the water's, you know, moving pretty quick, that when you're in it, it's gonna feel like it's really moving quick. And the deeper that gets, the worse it is. I kept sticking my trekking pole down in and a lot of these would have been up to my knees and a water crossing that goes up like I say halfway to your shins, it can take you over. So anyway, I get through the first one and, I, and it's just like a relief. I walk a half mile and there's another one. Now, here's the story about the day. I went through about five of these water crossings. Every single one 
got harder and harder and harder to cross. It was a full day of hiking and I think I logged 10 miles that day. I remember even in the video stating that I just, I couldn't do more. I knew that after I did like five of them that there was going to be more and I just had to stop and set up camp, which was smart because it stopped raining. The next day the water crossings uh, weren't as bad. They, they were still a little, little tricky but these were really mentally taxing on me number one i think because i was alone if i would have had somebody out there with me i wouldn't have been like a scared it, like it, it just would have made me feel a little bit better having somebody out there even if there was a log going across the water was like skidding over the log and they were slippery and then there was the challenge of every single one of these finding the trail on the other side i don't like watching those videos because i feel like uh like it's a downer of a video i'm not real happy giggly smiley like i normally am looking back at it excellent type two fun totally would do it again Whew, that was a long one okay we're gonna speed these up a little bit number two shawnee ticks Oh, okay, so middle of August, 93 plus degrees, crazy humidity. If you're not from the east here, like in Ohio, you guys out west, you don't know what humidity is. Uh, we actually had a heat advisory out that day, which means they're saying don't go outside unless you have to. But I had a backpacking trip planned. I was doing the 40 mile Shawnee State Forest Loop in Ohio solo, so nobody was with me. Uh, I started out late afternoon, so I was really trying to book miles on this. And even though I was drinking a lot of water and eating a lot of food, I didn't know about electrolytes. I really didn't know about how much I should be drinking, so I got pretty dehydrated. I was really trying to book to get to a certain campsite. Basically, I had 12 miles to go in a pretty short amount of time. Within two miles of the trail, I looked down on my ankle, and I see all these like little black dots all over my ankle, and I, I just kind of thought it was dirt or mud. I just thought, oh, that's that's kind of weird. Dry out here, but I got mud on me already. So fast forward, I cramped up so bad by mile nine, whether it be just straight from dehydration or lack of electrolytes or whatever, I was limping so bad. I could barely, barely walk. Easily the hardest section of hiking I've ever done. I've been in ultra marathons where I've uh, done the, the death march for a long time, but this was definitely the worst backpacking. It's never fun not knowing what your where your campsite is because it was a pain to walk 10 feet. So I didn't wanna have to like look around for tent sites. So I'm trying to get to the campsite. I get there, I set up a hammock, believe it or not, actually I had a hammock back then. Long story short, I get in the hammock, I'm laying there finally full relaxed and I look down at my ankle and look down at my leg and there's little tiny seed ticks. A lot of people think that they were chiggers, but I've done a lot of research on this. They were definitely seed ticks. So basically I walked through a tick nest, which is actually better than having the big ticks on you because I was probably their first host. So they probably weren't carriers of Lyme disease. And in hindsight, six years later now, I don't have Lyme disease. So that is true. But I just have these ticks all over my leg and I didn't know what to do. I, I remember I would try to pick them off, but it wasn't just like you, you scratch it and pick it you really had to work. You really had to work and pry to get each one of these ticks off. And I'm not joking, hundreds. They were all over me. Now keep in mind, I can barely walk. So whenever I notice that these ticks are on me, I don't even have the energy to get out of my tent and try scraping these off. I, I don't know if maybe I did once, like maybe got out and tried brushing them off or scraping them, but they wouldn't come off. and. I just remember just thinking they're ticks, they'll bite, they'll be there in the morning. So I tried to go to bed. Literally itched all night long. I thought that, you know, they would stay put. They just would bite and hang out there, but they didn't. I don't know if the, the baby ticks <laughs> don't do that, but they bite, they crawl around, they bite more, they crawl around, bite more. And even though they're always attached, they seem to always be moving. So I itched my legs all night long. It was a terrible, terrible experience. I think I got one hour of sleep that night. Hiked out the next day, took a shortcut to get back to the car, cut the uh, 40 mile loop into 27 miles. I think I actually had to hike like 15 miles with these ticks attached to me. Got back to the trailhead, pulled like two or three like big ticks off my back, drove four hours back home, and then spent over three and a half hours in the shower, in the bathtub, scraping and picking all these ticks off my body. It was a horrible, horrible experience. I finally got them off and my feet, my ankles were like straight off of like naked and afraid, like survival shows, just completely saturated in bug bites. Uh, the bug bites continued up my legs. They were all over my body. Like they were like kind of sporadic uh, up top. They weren't completely just full saturation of bug bites, but they were 
absolutely all over my entire body. So uh, that itched a little bit. I won't get into that, but <laughs> it sucked. Number three, this, this one's kind of funny. No chapstick. Other ones make this one sound like a walk in the park, but I don't know, I didn't bring chapstick on a trip. Uh, wind burnt, sunburnt, I don't remember what it was. I just know my lips were burning so bad. And this just goes with being prepared. I mean, I probably don't wear chapstick 350 days out of the year. Like it's just something you don't need until you really need it. Really uncomfortable and painful and hard for me to sleep uh, when I have super chapped lips. I know a lot of people don't have to deal with this. I know people that like never ever use chapstick, but even ever since I was a little kid, uh, I always get really, really chapped lips. And it's just one of those things that everybody's different. Whatever you think you might need out there, probably should bring it. It's gonna take a few trips, obviously, to know what you're not gonna need, but chapstick is the the one, one thing that comes on every single trip ever that I go on. Number four altitude sickness. I live at a comfortable 900 feet above sea level here. We fly out to Colorado, Denver, mile high city, 6,000 feet. We spend the night and the next day we start the trail. Oh, about 9,000 feet immediately climb up to 10. So within 12 hours of getting off the plane from living at 900 feet elevation, I'm hiking with over 30 pounds on my back at 10,000 feet, but it gets better. So we just climb and climb and climb. And I knew before we even got out of the car at the trailhead that I wasn't feeling right. I've never had altitude sickness before. I've been at altitude a few times, never had a problem, but something just didn't quite feel right. But I didn't really think that it would progress and get worse. But I think that alcohol played a part in that. So the guys I was with, we, we all had a few beers with us and my pack was heavy. So within like a mile or two of starting the trail, uh, we take our first like little sit down lunch break and I crack open a beer because I'm there to have a good time. I'm on vacation and not only that, I just wanted to get some weight off my back. So drinking a beer, that's an extra pound off my off my back. So we start hiking again and I think that that didn't help a lot. Cruise up to 11,000 feet and then cruise up for the first pass of the day. 12,000 feet. So no acclimation during this trip at all. Pretty dumb. I know a lot of people rip me in the comments in those videos, but I mean, we just didn't have time in our schedules for what we wanted to do to acclimate. When we were up at 12,000 at that pass, we cruised up there for, I want to say like two miles. So we hung out at 12,000 feet for a while. They all crack open a pass beer up there. Stupid. Crack open beer number two, 12,000 feet, even though I'm feeling pretty crappy. I did not realize how alcohol enhances altitude sickness because it definitely does. We cruise back down to probably 11,000 to camp. It's horrible, I'm dying at this point. Uh, I set up my chair, I'm just sitting there just trying to ride through it. It's not getting any better. Took all the energy I could muster up to set up my tent. I got in my sleeping bag, was probably asleep by like 7.30 that night. I remember just feeling full, like just completely sick. I wanted to throw up, super nauseous. I know a lot of people feel altitude in their lungs, they can't breathe. I didn't really have any of that, but my head just had a horrible headache and I don't really get headaches. I'm really fortunate. I don't get headaches often in day-to-day -day life. I was really like just woozy, like nothing felt right. I could not eat at all. Just ate a couple goldfish crackers and it took everything I could <laughs> to get those down. But that sucked. And luckily I woke up the next day and I felt okay. It did come back a little bit during the trip, but it was nothing like it was that first night. That first night, if there was a bailout option, I probably would have bailed. Number five, kind of lost with a question mark. So I was in West Virginia. Uh, I talked about this in my last video. Started at the wrong trailhead because a, another hiker lied, lied to me. Don't put trust in other backpackers. I was steered wrong. I mean, I guess it's my fault, but I still blame that dude. <laughs> but anyway, I hike out like a mile or so on pretty much like a deer trail and uh, it starts getting dark. I realize my mistake. I, I know what I did. I start backtracking to the truck. It's funny that I turned around within 10 feet. I completely lost the trail that I came in on I, and I couldn't find it anywhere. I'm going back and forth. Like you could see it going one way and I even tried turning around to find it. I, I could not find it. So as I'm going back towards my truck in the general direction, I'm not on a trail, completely lose sunlight and I need light to find my truck. I need light to figure out uh, how to get back. So 
I set up camp and I did not sleep good that night. Even though I knew the region I was in and I finally got a map to load uh, when I was in my tent at night, I had a compass and everything. It just was not a comforting feeling. I, I knew that I could figure it out in the morning, but the fact that I didn't quite know where I was, I just did not sleep good. I, I wanted to figure out that night. Like I really wanted to throw a headlamp on and get back to my truck that night, but that's not smart, you gotta play it safe. Uh, setting up camp was the smartest thing I could do, even though it did take me an hour and a half to, to find the trail the next day, because I actually couldn't even get back to where my truck was. It, like Looking at the map and everything, it was easier just to cut across a big field of rocks and shrubbery and get to the trail. So I got back and it was okay, but getting lost, it's it's hard and you, you make dumb decisions. Setting up camp was the smartest thing I could have done, but the, the thing that made this the worst was just the anticipation of knowing I have to correct my problem the next morning. If I would have been out there at noon, I, it would have been no problem at all, but just the fact that I had to set up camp and sleep, it just was a very uncomfortable feeling and for some reason I couldn't turn it off in my head. I just thought about it all night long. Worst night of sleep I've ever had in the tent, for sure. Altitude sickness, getting lost, all these things are not fun. If you want, check out my last video uh, on how not to get lost in the backcountry, all the things I've learned over the years. And hit that subscribe button, notification bell, and I'll see you on the next one.